The last days of September brought a series of unsettling jolts to the sea floor off the Pacific Northwest, stirring unease among those who follow the restless geology beneath Oregon's offshore waters. At about 11.45 in the evening on Thursday, September 25, 2025 Pacific Daylight Time, instruments of the United States Geological Survey recorded a magnitude 5.9 earthquake located roughly 230 kilometers or about 140 miles west of Bandon, Oregon. The event occurred at a depth of approximately 10 kilometers or about 6 miles beneath the seafloor. In the hours that followed, smaller tremors unfolded across the same stretch of crust. A magnitude 3.0 range aftershock rattled the seabed just after 12.20 in the morning on Friday, another at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and more minor shakes appeared as Friday drew to a close. Then, by Saturday afternoon, September 27, at about 3.12 post-meridian Pacific daylight time, another rupture was recorded, this one a magnitude 5.1 event positioned only a short distance from the earlier main shock. These successive jolts, lined up like beads along a scar in the oceanic crust, raised immediate questions. Was this merely routine release of tectonic strain, or could it be a precursor to something greater? Could these offshore adjustments ripple inland to awaken the long-dormant Cascadia subduction zone? The answer begins with a close look at where these quakes struck. They occurred not along the Cascadia megathrust itself, but along the Blanco Fracture Zone, an undersea transform fault that separates two restless plates, the Pacific Plate to the south and west and the Juan de Fuca Plate to the north and east. The Blanco Zone stretches for about 350 kilometers, or approximately 200 miles, across the seafloor west of Cape Blanco, Oregon. Unlike a subduction interface where one plate dives beneath another, this is a sideways slipping boundary. The two plates grind past one another laterally in what geologists call a right lateral strike-slip motion. In essence, each block of crust shifts sideways relative to the other, grinding and fracturing but not lifting or plunging dramatically. Because of this geometry, quakes on the Blanco fracture tend to displace the crust horizontally rather than vertically. That distinction matters. Vertical movement of the seabed is what pushes water upward to generate tsunamis. With horizontal slip, even large quakes fail to displace enough water to produce destructive waves. That is why the late September sequence, including the magnitude 5.9 and the magnitude 5.1 shocks, never produced tsunami warnings. Instruments confirmed that the focal mechanisms, the patterns of first arriving seismic waves, showed lateral slip, consistent with the expected strike-slip behavior. The tectonic explanation lies in the motions of the plates themselves. The Juan de Fuca plate is a small oceanic plate, a remnant of a once vast Farallon plate being created at the Juan de Fuca ridge and shoved eastward beneath North America at a rate of a few centimeters per year. Meanwhile, the Pacific plate is sliding northwestward at a similar pace. Where they meet along the Blanco Fault, the plates must move past each other and the strain of their locked edges eventually breaks in earthquakes. The oceanic crust here is relatively young and still hot from volcanic creation at the ridge, so it tends to be mechanically weaker. That weakness encourages more frequent but moderate ruptures rather than rare cataclysmic breaks. The September sequence is a classic illustration of this system in action. The magnitude 5.9 event on Thursday night appears to have been the primary rupture. The subsequent smaller tremors on Friday morning were aftershocks, adjusting surrounding segments of crust. By Friday night and Saturday morning, a few additional magnitude 3 quakes popped up, and by Saturday afternoon, a secondary rupture, the magnitude 5.1, tore a neighboring strand. Scientists sometimes compare this to a zipper opening, not in one smooth pull, but in fits and starts, each segment catching and then popping free. The historical record confirms that this part of the Blanco fracture has always been lively. Since the early 20th century, numerous quakes of magnitude 6 and greater have been catalogued here. In June of 1917, a magnitude 6.5 struck offshore. In May of 1968, a magnitude 6.4 appeared along nearly the same longitude. November of 1981 brought a magnitude 6.2, and March of 1985 yielded another magnitude 6.5. 
The 1990s produced a magnitude 6.3 in October of 1994. More recently, a magnitude 6.1 rattled the area in January of 2000, followed by a 6.2 in August of 2018, a 6.3 in August of 2019, and two six-point class events in October of 2024. Taken together, the pattern is clear. The Blanco zone produces moderate to strong earthquakes every few years, a steady pulse of tectonic adjustment. What links these events is their consistency in depth and location. Nearly all occur at shallow depths of about 10 kilometers or roughly 6 miles, right within the brittle upper oceanic crust. Nearly all cluster west of Bandon between 200 and 280 kilometers offshore, or between 120 and 170 miles from the coast, and nearly all reveal right lateral strike-slip motion. This repeated signature shows that the Blanco transform fault is accommodating steady, sideways shear between the Pacific and Juan de Fuca plates. The megathrust of Cascadia, by contrast, lies closer to the shoreline and dips beneath the continent, locked tight and waiting for its eventual massive release. Because the Blanco zone is situated well offshore, the energy it releases rarely causes significant shaking on land. Residents of Oregon and Northern California usually do not feel the magnitude 5 range quakes at all, and even the magnitude 6 events are often reported only faintly along the coast. The September 25th magnitude 5.9 was lightly felt by a small number of coastal residents, but it caused no damage. The latest magnitude 5.1 went unnoticed on shore. In other words, these quakes are part of the planet's internal accounting system, adjustments along a transform fault that bleed off energy harmlessly at sea. Still, the question lingers. Do such offshore quakes influence the Cascadia subduction zone? After all, Cascadia is the looming giant, locked along hundreds of kilometers of coastline from Northern California to British Columbia, capable of unleashing a magnitude 9 rupture with devastating tsunami. The prevailing scientific answer is that Blanco quakes and Cascadia quakes are largely independent. The Blanco fault lies about 200 kilometers or 120 miles west of the Cascadia megathrust. The crust between them is rigid enough that stress changes from Blanco events dissipate before reaching Cascadia's locked zone. No recorded Blanco earthquake has ever been followed by a Cascadia rupture, nor is there a physical mechanism by which a moderate strike-slip-slip event could trigger a subduction megathrust collapse so far away. The Blanco system does, however, highlight the broader dynamism of the region. The Juan de Fuca plate is hemmed in on multiple sides. To the south lies the Gorda plate and the volatile Mendocino triple junction, where three major faults the San Andreas, the Cascadia, and the Mendocino Transform collide. To the north, the Juan de Fuca Ridge continues to create new sea floor. The Blanco Fracture acts as a mediator between these forces, accommodating side-to-side -side motion where direct subduction cannot. That is why geologists see it light up with swarms of quakes every few years. It is a pressure valve in the tectonic system. In the most recent case, analysis suggests that the rupture sequence began on one strand of the eastern Blanco and then propagated westward across parallel fractures. The magnitude 5.9 was the strongest slip, followed by redistribution of stress onto neighboring cracks, producing the smaller aftershocks and culminating in the 5.1 rupture a day and a half later. Each event was shallow confined to the top few miles of crust, and each slipped laterally. The ocean floor above did not heave and the water column above remained largely undisturbed. For coastal residents, the takeaway is paradoxical reassurance. These quakes remind us that the earth beneath the Pacific Northwest is in constant motion, yet at the same time they show that not every tremor heralds catastrophe. The Cascadia megathrust remains ominously quiet, storing centuries of strain, but it does so independently of Blanco's sideways shifts. The magnitude 5.1 quake of September 27th is simply the latest entry in a long list of offshore adjustments, one more beat in the tectonic rhythm of the Juan de Fuca plate grinding against the Pacific. Scientists, however, seize every such event as a research opportunity. 
Each earthquake provides data, waveforms that map the fault geometry, aftershock sequences that reveal stress distribution, and GPS records that measure the minute motions of plates. Collectively, these data refine models of how the Blanco system interacts with adjacent tectonic boundaries. The better those models become, the more accurately scientists can assess long-term hazards, not only for the Blanco fault itself, but also for Cascadia, whose eventual rupture will dwarf these offshore tremors. For now, though, the sea has settled once more. The fishing fleets and cargo ships traversing Oregon's offshore waters may have felt no more than a subtle shiver in the deep. The coast remains unscathed, the beaches untouched by tsunami, and life on shore continues undisturbed. Far beneath the waves, the Blanco fracture has done what it always does, release built-up stress in a modest burst, reminding us that the Earth's crust is never still. And so, the latest magnitude 5.1 earthquake west of Bandon is both unremarkable and profound. Unremarkable because it caused no damage and fits squarely within the well-established pattern of Blanco activity. Profound because it is yet another glimpse into the restless gears of plate tectonics, the unseen machinery that shapes continents and seafloors alike. The Blanco Fracture Zone, the Juan de Fuca Plate, and the mighty Cascadia Subduction Zone remain locked in their slow-motion dance, a dance measured not in human lifetimes, but in centuries and millennia. Each tremor is a step in that choreography, and each deserves our attention, not as a harbinger of doom, but as a reminder that the earth beneath us is alive with motion. If you found this breakdown insightful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And tap that hype icon to help this video reach a wider audience. Your support makes all the difference in getting this critical information out there.